Hello, and welcome to Ben Yo Chats. If you're curious about the world, this show is for you. What should we be doing about climate policy? On this episode, I speak to Chris Stark. Chris is the CEO of the UK's Climate Change Committee and a leading thinker on climate policy. We speak on the transition to net zero, the investment needed, and what is most misunderstood. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast. Thank you. Be well. Hey, everyone. I'm super glad uh, to be having Chris Stark with me. Uh, Chris is the chief executive of the UK's Climate Change Committee. Uh, The committee is an independent statutory body which advises the UK and develop government on uh, missions, targets, and preparing for and adapting to the impacts of climate change. And I think he is one of the most important and thoughtful thinkers on climate change policy today. Chris, welcome. Hi, Ben. It's very good to be here. So what do you think is perhaps the most misunderstood about climate policy and thinking today? For me, at least for a UK perspective, I was quite moved by your committee's work that suggested, although we need a large amount of capital investment, particularly turning over capital stock about around the order of say 50 billion or 60 billion a year, at least in terms of percentage GDP, this was maybe 1% of GDP and that this investment generates a lot of positive economic returns, not in, just in terms of climate, but a lot of uh, natural capital, but a lot of many other co-benefits. And I guess you can see this on the individual basis. So if you upgrade your fridge, obviously that costs you say a thousand pounds, a lot of capital expense, but you get lower operating costs and your fridge is cooler and has got all the, all the latest kind of things. And I kind of feel when I talk to people, people don't really understand that, that actually on a net basis, it may not cost that, that much. Um, what is it for you? Is it along the lines of that, which you can elaborate on, or is it a couple of other things which you think is misunderstood? Well, I think there are misunderstandings all, all over the place. I mean, it's the top misunderstanding is that climate change is something that's, you know, a bit further down the road. You know, that we're going to, we will get to climate change, but we will need to worry about it right now. I think that's the kind of number one, uh, uh, what number one fallacy uh, is, is with us now. I mean, we, we are speaking today in January and it's, really warm it's very unusually warm and uh, you can see that it's actually now affecting the the, the, the growing season so the, you know there are clues everywhere and although that sounds quite nice that's actually very problematic you know there's all sorts of reasons why that's a problem if the pollinators aren't there for the flowers when they come out then you've got a real problem with biodiversity and you know the whole kind of system of uh, of of food, for example, that we have as well. So that so that, so the climate thing is, I think, number one is the, the, this idea that it, it's something that can wait, and we still get that, even though, of course, it's much more uh, popular in the discussion uh, today. Um, but I think the other one is the one that you raised, and you completely nailed it in the way that you described it. This idea that somehow tackling the issues of uh, that you know the underlying cause of climate change is going to be ruinously expensive. Uh, it, it just isn't. And it's, and I, I should really like the way you described it there. Challenge is that we have lots of things, technologies that we use in everyday life right across the economy in every corner of uh, modern life. We use fossil fuel technologies. We kind of we've kind of got to the point where we don't even notice it because it's so pervasive in the West, certainly. And um, we've got to change that. And it is a huge shift to change that. There's a massive inertia in the system, all the infrastructure that's been there to establish those fossil fuel uh, paradigms in you know, every sector of the economy. Um, they need to change. That is predominantly about investing. So we need to invest to change the assets that we are using. So you mentioned it, you know, fridge is one of those you know, you know, fossil fuel assets at the moment because it uses electricity, but you can get a better fridge a more, more kind of obvious example is the car that you might drive, which at the moment most of us drive a petrol or diesel car. In the future, that could be an electric car. That requires investment to change over these capital assets. Um, and it takes time to do that unless you're willing to do something pretty radical and strand those assets, you know, to, to stop using them before they get to the end of their useful life. But that's investment. And it does cost, there's no doubt there's a big investment cost to it. But the key thing and the thing that most people don't understand is that in the use of those assets that you replace uh, those fossil fuel assets with, so the electric car or or even that fridge that you talked about uh, or something called a heat pump, something an alternative way of of heating your home, they are much more efficient in the way they use energy. Uh, They're typically electrical 
so if you can decarbonize the electricity to those devices, then you've got you know cheap, uh, you know, readily available decarbonized source of energy, and they're cheap to run. And if you net those two things off, that big capital cost and the and the cost of using it, the, the cheaper cost of using it, then you get to this very low cost all across the economy. It's, it's close to zero percent. And actually, in these moments of high fossil fuel prices, it actually gets slightly cheaper to decarbonize because, of course, we're you know this is the alternative to that. So it's um, it, the relative cost falls. So uh, there are lots of things that people assume out there in climate land uh, when they're commentating on, on it. But actually, most of it you can kind of puncture with a bit of analysis, which is largely what we're here to do. And do you think so that holds for the UK? Do you think very broadly that holds globally as well? It seems to on some of the analysis I've seen, but I don't think I've seen it as in depth as as what you guys have done for the UK, but it, it would seem to hold that that logic. Obviously, emerging markets will be slightly different on the curve, and they could, in fact, leapfrog to, to, to some degree. And maybe we're seeing that in places like uh, China in some aspects or, or already, because one of the pushbacks I get when I talk to people who are sort of open minded, but a bit skeptical, but they say, oh, what about China or oh, what about the world? So the UK can do it now. There's a kind of historical maybe moral and ethical imperative for for why the uk should be one of the first in in any event and so should maybe the developed nations but even putting that to one one side do you think that broadly holds globally yeah it really does i mean actually the uk is one of the hardest places in the world to decarbonize you could say it's the hardest actually when we we're 30 years ago we were really starting on that journey it probably was the hardest place because we had been most invested more invested rather than any other country in the world in fossil fuels, because we started it off really since the industrial revolution. There are parts of the world that haven't made that journey quite as extensively as Western economies like the UK. And actually they should be even cheaper to decarbonize. And this is the exciting thing for me. Now, it's convenient to use fossil fuels. So I think this is the challenge that you, you, know, you, can, you can take a lump of coal out of the ground today. I can hold it in my hand. And you know, I could put it on my on my desk for a thousand years. It will still retain the energy that you know you might, might might want eventually within it. It's a convenience to have that coal. If you fall down the trap of going for that convenience, um, building out the kind of infrastructure that older Western economies have have built out based on fossil fuels, um, then you will you will face big challenges in the future to convert back to something zero carbon in the future. The challenge for those economies, uh, I mean, China might be one of them, the developing economies, as they are sometimes known, most notable probably India, is to not go down the route of building out that fossil fuel infrastructure in the first place. And there's really interesting questions about whether a country like India needs a kind of national grid in the way that we have in the UK, for example. And it might be much cheaper for them not to do that, to have solar, for example, and wind and and um, and hydro as the, as the core basis of their own energy system, but in a kind of a set of islands across the whole country. That is probably a cheaper energy system. So yeah, that story does hold in other countries. In fact, it's been probably more compelling in other parts of the world. So coming out of COP26, we had some progress and some continued areas of improvement, and we're gonna go into COP27, 28, 29, and further on. It's a kind of ongoing progress rather than a sort of point in time. But what would you point to as maybe uh, successes on the global community basis and, and what would you like to see maybe areas of where we could improve? Yeah, COP26 was really interesting for a whole load of reasons and I find it personally very interesting because it was it was in my home city. So, I mean, the topic that I cover in my professional life is climate change and it was in my home city of Glasgow. Uh, quite a good place to host it actually because it's quite set up quite nicely to, to deal with a, a conference of that kind of scale. And I think he did a reasonably good job of it. But apart from all that, the kind of personal story from, from on COP26 for me, for me, the really interesting thing about this COP was that it was it was it was criticised by some as a corporate COP, um, and it was a corporate COP. I think, and I don't think that there's any shame in that. Actually, I think that the really interesting thing at COP26 was that it was the first time I felt, at least, that at a COP, corporates turned up. I mean, you could tell that it was it was it was the AAA. CEOs, you know, top financiers, they were there. Uh, they weren't just there because they wanted to be part of the, the show. They were there because I think they could see the opportunity in all of this for the first time. 
And you get this really interesting thing happening now where the economics of the transition uh, to decarbonize the global economy get better and better each year. Uh, the cost of solar falls each year, the cost of wind falls each year. You're kind of constructing technologies that can use those energy sources and that gets better each year as well. That eventually becomes very compelling. And I think actually that's what we saw. So although that story has been brewing for a while, this was the cop where it became clear that those kind of AAA blue chip corporates and financiers were interested. And then you have the thing that you always get at a cop, which was that civil society was there making its voice heard. Now, interesting, I think when you get pressure from both of those things together, as world leaders start to get squeezed and, and start to raise the ambition, we saw a bit of that at Glasgow in COP26, but we didn't see enough. But the kind of really interesting thing for me, at least, is that in, in Glasgow, what we saw was an almost universal view that net zero, this, this concept of getting to the point where you are emitting as much as you take out of the atmosphere to get to this kind of balanced position, net zero carbon dioxide is now a kind of pretty pretty universal aim for every country in the world. 90% of the world's economy is now under some sort of net zero target by mid-century. That's amazing. You know, that is, that is a real, real step forward. So we've not had that at the COP before. And we didn't even have that, you know, three or four or five years ago. I mean, this is a huge, huge step forward. I think the UK can lay some claim to helping that process, actually, by being willing to make that the target, actually a slightly tougher target in the UK, because it looks at not just carbon dioxide, but all greenhouse gases, tougher basis. But that was, that was a big part of the story in Glasgow. But what was absent was the, the near term ambition to drive the transition. And the change in the climate is ruthless. It, it, it only cares about the cumulative CO2 that's put into the atmosphere. So it's great to have those mid century goals, but unless they're accompanied by short-term action to suppress emissions, that carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels mainly, then unless we have that, then we keep pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the temperature inexorably on the planet keeps rising. So, you know, we haven't got the ambition right for 2030. And I think for me, that's the, that's the disappointment in COP is that we, could, we didn't get that kind of, you know, triple A, uh, I mentioned that already when it came to corporates, we didn't get the same... Uh, the same ambition from some world leaders, especially for 2030. Uh, some countries of the world really should have done better. Russia, uh, China could have done more. Uh, Australia could have done more. Uh, Indonesia could have done more. Uh, you know, there's, there's Brazil could have done more. So I think there, there, is, there is still a gap and it can be closed, but it's, it's a hell of a job now over the next, well, there's only nine years now to get to kind of make sure that we try and tackle that 2030 goal in the way that we need to. Otherwise, this kind of strap line for COP26, which was keeping alive the temperature outcome of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Well, I'm afraid that slips from view very quickly indeed if we keep going on the same trajectory for carbon dioxide emissions. So I suppose that for me, this, this was the COP, but there was, there was some really good bits in it and stuff to hang your hat on. Uh, we finally tackle the issue of fossil fuels in a text from the UN, but there's lots still to worry about it. So COP27 is, is where we go next. I, I can chime in with a, a lot of that. So uh, I've been an investor and I was speaking to a large healthcare company CEO probably about a year ago and saying that a lot of his end asset owners investors wanted him to think about net zero for the company. And he was open-minded. He says, yes, this is definitely a problem. And then said, well, you know, healthcare, we're not the most intense company. It's probably not within our top five risks. And when we do our analysis, but we, we, we should think about it. Maybe we'll do something. And was kind of uh, like sort of mildly positively committed, but nothing that I thought would get done anytime soon. And then fast forward to the second half of the year, uh, there was a real step change in the rhetoric uh, committed to uh, mid-century net zero, but more than that was going to go negative by 2030 and had put this short-term action plan in place. And that was really in the space of, say, six to nine months and pressures obviously from both employees, outside stakeholders, probably investors, and that and, and coming to the right things to do. So I do think there is this shift in corporate land, although again, not across everyone on, on, on everything, but for, you know, this is a company, billions of dollars in revenues, hundreds and thousands of employees. So I, I think that was quite uh, interesting. And then the second order effect of the fact that 
what we forget is that CEOs speak to politicians and governments all the time. And so they are uniquely influential as well as civil society and everything uh, else, because they're saying, well, we've done it and we're just doing it regardless. Uh, so in that in one sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting you raised that though, Ben. I mean, I think they, for me, there's a really interesting story behind that about how change happens. So I, there is still a bit, we talk a lot about policy in my job. So people refer to policy and policy makers. Um, and there is a sort of notion sometimes about how policy is made by governments. And, and the thing, I still hear it occasionally, the thing that is often said is that, you know, leaders in governments um, respond to what voters demand. And in democracies like the UK, you get a manifesto uh, at an election, the party of government is elected on the strength of that manifesto and then they implement these policies as though it's a sort of transaction between voters and politicians. Now, there are other systems of government, of course, but I'm thinking particularly of democracies like the UK here. Um, it doesn't really work like that in my experience. And, and actually the, the kind of process of change, especially as, as far as policy is concerned, is, is a bit more organic and interesting actually. And a lot of it is to do with corporates and uh, their willingness to change. And actually governments and, world and, and leaders hear that, I, I think more directly than we do sometimes the voters. It's almost as though voters have a veto actually, I often think. But if you think it, it, one of the interesting, in my world at least, one of the interesting transitions that's ahead for us is in, the, uh, in, the, in vehicles, in fossil fuel vehicles to, to, to electric vehicles in the future. Now that is a fascinating transition uh, and mostly consumers haven't been asking for that kind of transition to take place. It has been actually a, a more of a, an interesting discussion between governments um, cognizant of the, you know, the, some of the environmental impacts of cars, but also some of the industrial impacts of car making and those automotive manufacturers. And you get the policy discussion happening a lot in that space, actually. So creating the incentives that, that countries around the world have put in place for electric cars um, as a means to grow the production of those cars and you know, the economic benefit of, of, of that for those countries that do so. That actually is a discussion between government and corporate. Uh, and we, the consumer, uh, then buy the thing that, that, that comes out of that that you know, via policy. And I think actually a lot of this, there's all sorts of those kind of tra transitions still to come. And I think we should think more deeply about how the policy process works, because if you do so, you can actually accelerate it. And that's exactly what's happened with electric vehicles, actually. It's been the process of creative policy making, particularly in places like California, that has dramatically shifted you know, the pace with which we think we can make that. Uh, that transition. And just one final point on that particular transition is I think it's really interesting that the conventional view on how you decarbonize uh, the transport system, say 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, maybe even as late as 10 years ago, was that you had to tax the fuel for those cars. You had to put a carbon tax on the petrol, the diesel, the gas for the car. Uh, and eventually the consumer will flip to something else. But actually that story of how we've subsidized and supported and encouraged and regulated for electric vehicles hasn't really involved doing that kind of taxation at all. And that tends to be a better way to get things done quickly. And it's also a politically more acceptable way of doing it because consumers don't like paying higher taxes. So I think that some of, the, some of this stuff actually really matters for some of the other things, some of the other technological shifts that need to happen across the economy. So I actually think we should think more about that, how that policy process works. That's really fascinating to me because that ties in quite a few relatively complex observations that I've had, although contested. But to me, that's putting together this idea that maybe we have median voter theory where the, where the median voter is and this idea of the Overton window where you might get uh, a window of policy ideas done. But if you look at it, if you, if you want to really reflect that in democracies, politicians have to kind of reflect that median voter to some degree, the median voter really is signaling to us they don't like carbon taxes or prices and that's been pretty consistent wherever there's been a little bit of flex but overall you're not passing that through uh, a median voter type of um uh median voter type of thing but um otherwise if you think about what you're saying about call it a kind of industrial strategy or industrial policy you can get corporates and say transport's a good 
way, or maybe even buildings is where we do it, where corporates and buildings might agree like, okay, we can do efficiency and decarbonization there. We don't necessarily need a carbon price. We can do a, a mixture of raising standards and some other incentives and do it by a set of sector by sector uh, policies, which actually get there without having to, well, you're within the Overton window because you're not necessarily doing a carbon tax and something like that, but you're getting to a place where you can affect policy more quickly and maybe as, if, as effectively sort of the jury's still out on, on, on carbon within that. And I'm hearing more and more thinkers articulate this sort of view that actually we could do this maybe in the areas where we need. So in this country, like you say, transport buildings, maybe agriculture and land use, and you don't have to use so much political capital on something like a carbon tax or price. There is there is an underlying background. It always helps to have a price on something, but you might be able to get there with a, just a well thought out sector strategy, which if it has corporate buy-in, if you've got corporate buy-in policy support and the consumer is not giving you a veto, then you can kind of go ahead and do it. Does that kind of yeah. make sense as a kind of policy framework as a theory of change? Very much so. I mean, if you look at the, I've been in this job for four years, four or five years now, and um, the, the whole time I've been doing this job, that is the kind of advice that we've been pushing out to the government. This idea that you actually need uh, sector-specific strategies for decarbonizing. And, and the reason that that's important is because the conditions are different in every sector. Now, you definitely do need a background carbon price. You need something that gives us gives a strong signal to markets to move away from the thing that is causing the environmental damage. But the old kind of, and I, I say old actually, but you still hear this extensively, particularly from those in the oil and gas sector, interestingly enough, but you, you still hear this, this idea that we can do it all with carbon pricing, but the, we know that's politically unsuccessful. Uh, and I'm not making, I mean, I'm a, I, I run an organization that gives technical advice. I'm not making a, I'm not making a, you know, a, a, a political point here. Um, uh, really important to say that, that, that you, we, we know it doesn't work because consumers don't like paying higher taxes. That's not, it's not, it's not a fairly obvious thing to say. So I think if we can look around that, and increasingly using regulations and standards to try and drive the transition. Uh, and, and with in mind the idea that doing so actually will cut the cost to the consumer if those technologies can achieve scale. That's really important in this transition. And that's the kind of advice that we've been offering. And it matters particularly because what's anchoring the whole strategy in the UK and increasingly in other countries is this concept of getting to net zero or a goal by a certain date. Now, if you do that, it helps to work back from that date to work out at what point you need these technology transitions to take place. Because what you want to do ideally is to achieve the technology transition without stranding assets excessively. And that basically, you know, if you want to get to net zero by 2050, kind of interesting stat for you is that the, 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 if you buy a fossil fueled asset technology today, it will probably be in use for between 15 and 20 years. So if you wanna to get to net zero by 2050, you really gotta stop selling those assets by around 2030, you know, slightly earlier in some sectors, slightly later in others, but that kind of date really matters because then you can achieve a kind of a smoother transition. You can, you can replace assets as they reach the end of their life. Otherwise, you know, something much more disruptive is required. Now that's, really helpful if you're trying to anchor some of these technology transitions so you can set uh, as we have done in this country a, a goal for for the the ending of sales of fossil fuel vehicles for for cars and vans in this country by a date that's compatible with that 2050 transition i think we could do more of that and really interestingly that that didn't involve doing carbon pricing you could argue there's a sort of shadow carbon price in that but what it really does is send an incredibly strong signal to the two really important um, uh, participants in the market, the consumer and the producer, they both know what to do then. And they see that coming and you get this kind of innovation cycle happening that drives down the cost. And that's exactly what we're seeing in electric vehicles. Now we can do that in other areas. So I am, you know, as much as I am, I'm often accused of being overly optimistic about how this transition can be achieved at low cost. Well, I actually think we've been conservative about that because we're not, we're not actually trying to draw in too much of that cost reduction story in the analysis that we've done. If we did, I think we could really, really bring the cost down in our assessment even further. So I'm pretty sure that's the way it'll go. Excellent. 
I was speaking to Zeke Hausfather the other day on a recent podcast. Uh, he's a climate uh, scientist. And he was making the point that so-called doomsday scenarios of say above four degrees or for instance, where life on earth ceases to exist is kind of very unlikely. That's very pessimistic. On the other hand, the challenge was really serious and that in his view, one and a half degrees given whatever what's baked in is, is very unlikely to happen. So you're probably on a trajectory where even two degrees is possible, but optimistic. Four degrees would also be possible, but quite pessimistic. And then taking all of that of what's baked in, there's a lot of adaptation which is going to have to happen because there's a lot of baked into what we already see what's going to happen in, in 2050. And your recent uh, letter that you put out in January pushes forward the idea that we probably do need to do more on adaptation and perhaps our policy thinking on here is less well uh, developed given what's already baked in in, in 2050. So what do you think on that adaptation call and, and where are you hoping to see more policy perhaps from a UK uh, perspective in 2022 and thinking about adaptation and what's already baked in? So adaptation is I think still the kind of uh, I've described it as the Cinderella is the, it's the, it's the Cinderella of climate uh, uh, discussion or climate policy is a slightly forgotten thing and it really shouldn't be uh, I don't think it's helped by the name. I don't like the name adaptation. I think it sort of it's a t it tends to put people off, but I haven't found a, a better term. Resilience is sometimes thought of as a kind of way into it. But it's not quite the same thing. But I do think we need to start talking about it. Um, and this this idea, I think, that that occasionally takes hold in the minds of some of the commentators that we mustn't talk about adapting to the changing climate because it will somehow take the pressure off mitigating the climate changes in the first place. I, I think that's that's for the birds. We're going to have to bring these two things together. And, and the reason I say that is because I'm afraid with quite a high degree of certainty, most of the change over the next 30 years, let's say, in the climate is now baked in. Um, a reminder, we've warmed the planet by about 1.1 degrees centigrade. Now, that doesn't sound like very much. Remember, that's an average. Um, uh, and that's an average land temperature. The, the, the differences, there are differences across the world, the differences in, uh, depending whether you're on land or in water, uh, depending whether you're in the upper atmosphere or down below. But 1.1 actually is, it may not sound a lot, but it, it's a huge shift in planetary terms. Um, and there's a lot more still to come. And I'm afraid that that is driven almost entirely. I mean, we might as well say entirely by the change in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And what's driving that is us. And it is mainly a story of our use of fossil fuels. And um, we will, I'm afraid, reach that 1.5 degree centigrade threshold. Uh, I think with a pretty high degrees of certainty now, and that's what the, you know, the, the, the UN scientific clearinghouse said as well. Uh, the, the, and, and I'm afraid that's, that's just an inevitability now. The question is, is whether we, we halt there or, or, or keep rocketing through into higher temperatures. And we really should try and avoid that because the damage to the, the, you know, the global economy, the damage to the welfare of people living in the global economy, the damage to, 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 to systems that we rely on throughout the world is, is dramatic. And uh, every fraction of a degree of warming, uh, should be, we should try and avoid it if we possibly can. And I don't think, that, this is very much the dog that has not yet barked, uh, I don't think people have clocked how important this is uh, and how quickly the change is now upon, it's come, it was happening and it is upon us. The 10 warmest years here in the UK have all been since 2002. Um, we are now kind of consistently each year getting warmer temperatures. That With that comes more extreme weather. And I'm afraid we're going to have to reach net zero in that warming climate. So that kind of brings in this question of whether you do adaptation or mitigation. And actually, that's for me, that's a kind of that's a, that, that's just a false dichotomy. You've got to do both together. And I'm really keen on making this point because actually, if you, even if you take very simple things like the kind of transition in the energy sector that we have been advising uh, for net zero, we also have to think about having a resilient energy system in a warming climate that achieves net zero. And you need to think about those two things now, actually. So I just, that is one good example of where we need adaptation, actually. So we know we're gonna have a more renewables-based energy system in the future in this country. Uh, we know that our energy system more generally will be more reliant on electricity. That means we have greater risks uh, when we have interruption to the electricity supply 
greater risks of extreme weather means we can't generate electricity from renewables. So we should be thinking about these things now. And I think actually when you do that, you get into a more um, optimistic framing perhaps of what can be done here. We can talk about a well-adapted economy that is also achieving net zero. And actually, I think that is a that is a positive discussion. We've got to get out of this negative framing of it all. I'm afraid that's the, that's that's what's causing us not to act on it. But um, that's a big challenge. It's, that's something that I think my institution is going to have to pick up. I agree. I th I always liken it to the the fact that there is no reason we can't walk and chew gum at the same time, given given what we have to do on this. And actually, when you're thinking about let's call it re resilience work, they often spark ideas because some resilience is going to need innovation and technology change. And some of it can also be used for mitigation, but also just that thinking about having to invest for essentially a better future on either arm sparks that thinking. Whereas ig ignoring it, you know, putting your head in the sands around it is, is just as bad on, on that as, as, it, as it were to sort of say, okay, we're not gonna do anything on the mitigation side, you know, where we're gonna have to do both. So I think that's interesting. And some of the it's, resistance- it's really it's really tough, though. I mean, I, the, I was looking at this. I did a presentation a few weeks back, and um, one of the things I was looking at, I was going to pull out some stats on the change that we've seen in the UK climate. We've done quite a lot on that in the last 12 months. And um, uh, you and I were chatting before this podcast began. You were born in 1978, so was I. I hope you don't mind telling your listeners that. But um, 1978, um, that's more or less the, the point from which we start managing, from one of the points from which we start um, measuring the change in temperature in this UK. So that we look at the 1981 era, uh, 1981 to 2000, and 0. 0.6 degrees centigrade from 1981 of warming has occurred. So basically what that means is the reframing this all, that since you and I were born, half of the global temperature increase that we are now suffering from climate change has happened. So it's in that it's in your lifetime that half of that has happened. So it is really accelerating, and um, it's uh, sadly it's not a surprise because the scientists have been warning about this for decades now. So sometimes it's presented as a surprise that we're seeing this accelerated warming, or somehow that it's worse than was expected. It's not. It's exactly what was expected. The models have been pretty accurate at predicting it. Halting that is really tough, and I think the other thing is it's just halting it. The, there is a question about whether we can reverse it. But the first thing we've got to grab is the challenge of actually halting it. And that only happens when you get to net zero globally. So this thing about doing the two things together, it, it's very hard to explain it, but it's, it's really, really important that we do it. And um, you know, governments around the world are gonna to have to grab this. I hope the UK will be one of the places that gets ahead of it. But um, you know, involves spending money, sadly, it involves putting policies in place that are a longer term that tend not to be the kind of policies that governments that want to be elected on a four or five year cycle want to implement. So I don't dismiss how challenging this is. I agree. We, we definitely have to do both. There was an insightful report into climate change and behavior change, which was only available for a short while on the government website uh, before it was removed. Uh, because this government in particular seems currently intent on not raising possible behavior changes such as going vegetarian or uh, once a week or something or, or flying less. And on the one hand, it seems completely fair to me that elected representatives influence the course of policy and, uh, and you can see that and you know they have to reflect that and government has choices about where they want to put policy. On the other hand, I can see that cultural change often happens uh, for good or for bad, actually, despite or without government policy, and in fact, can go the other way. And I think of big social change movements, like really big ones. So the, the ending of slavery or uh, uh, women's votes or minority rights, which kind of came ground up and had a cultural change element. And then, uh, and then government changed because society had already uh, changed first. And, and, and I think to some degree, maybe it's correct that when you get a government uh, which is too uh, on the nose about behavior change. The population often reacts the other way because we don't like, or a lot of societies don't like being told what to do, but wherever it comes ground up because this is what we want to do, it obviously becomes an, an, easier, uh, an easier thing. So I was interested because actually in one of the analysis I saw from the CCC, behavior change could add an element to that, although you could take it from other places. I'd be interested in your views on where you sit on behavior change ideas or maybe even cultural change ideas. I'm quite 
um, keen on cultural change, although I don't exactly know where it, where it happens. <laughs> Uh, but I, and I'm a little bit maybe more skeptical on where government mandated from is, but it is definitely a, a mechanism and lever that we could push. And some of it might even just be on innovation, right? We were going to need people to want to replace their fridges and their cars, be amenable to spending some of this money, future generations. And, and maybe if they wanted to, um, you know, eat less beef once a, once a week, then that would also be fine. So I, I'm interested on, on where you sit on where there's pros and cons on it. Yeah, I mean, I, there were lots of things to say on this. So um, let's just kind of go from the top. You asked about behaviour change. And actually, it's not, a, it's not a term I like very much. I think behaviour change implies bad behaviour. And I, I, behaviour just is, when we're talking at a societal level. Um, the, the challenge of changing it, though, is a real one, right? So we want to, we want to, we, 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 I, in, in all of the work we do, we see a really important role for changing behaviours and lifestyles in, you know, assisting this transition to net zero that I've been talking about today. Um, really interesting. One of the last pieces of work that we did before we published um, the advice that led to the UK's net zero target back in 2019. That was a very last minute thing, actually. We thought we'd just kind of step back. We'd sort of built this pathway out to net zero, a loose pathway for how the UK economy could decarbonize to net zero to kind of justify the analysis that we the recommendation that we've done and one of the things we were able to do for the first time is just step back from it and say right to what degree is this transition due to technology shift uh, and to what degree does it rest on some change in behavior in society and it was really striking that you the kind of pure technology changes that have driven emissions down to date in the UK and by that I mean things like closing a coal-fired power station and replacing it with a wind farm. That's a kind of pure technology change in the sense that I, as a consumer, when I boil my kettle, don't know that the electron uh, was generated from a wind farm. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that happens somewhere else. There's a lot of that still to come. So these sort of technology shifts is about uh, two-fifths of the total emissions reductions out for the next sort of 15, 20 years. Two-fifths of it comes from that kind of technology shift. The rest of it involves some change in behaviour. I, I'm it's really interesting when we when we sort of sat back and looked at that, and we repeated the exercise last year, about a year ago, when we did our most recent advice on the path for UK emissions. We had five separate scenarios uh, for getting to net zero. One of them actually focused on changing behaviour. But um, in all of those scenarios, behaviour change is important. And um, yeah, the rest of it, the kind of more than more than half, uh, involves some element of changing behaviour. Some of that is what you might call a kind of pure behaviour change. So changing your diet, I suppose, is the best example of that. But, but actually most of it, over 40% of the emissions reductions that we are predicting would be necessary by 2035 are a mixture of technology change and behavior change. And that's the stuff that I find most interesting. So that's us moving to using heat pumps, um, which is a shift in behavior because you don't use a heat pump the way you use a gas boiler. That's us using electric vehicles rather than petrol cars because you've got to plug them in differently. That's a behavior change. There is, a, there is a need for some changes over and above that. And I think the most obvious of those is diet. The other one that people talk a lot about, including us, is um, flying, doing less of the kind of flying stuff. Um, uh, but actually, that, that, that wedge in the pie chart that we produced was less than a fifth. So actually, although behavior change is important, it, it is mainly about how we use these new technologies that will help us to get to net zero. And I think we should be more willing, therefore, to talk about changing behaviour because you, you raised another question, another, another term in your question to me about culture. And actually, I don't think that we need a change in culture to get to net zero. By and large, the kind of culture and lifestyle that we have as, as the UK today is what I think we will have in 2050. We'll still be, you know, travelling to traveling on roads and cars, we'll just be electric cars, we'll still be warm in our homes. So I think this idea that you need some dramatic shift in the, you know, the kind of fundamentals of, the, of the, you know, the whole economy is worth probing a bit. But definitely we think it's important to change behaviors. It definitely makes the whole thing easier. And for me, this is the last point on this, from my, uh, for, on this particular point, that's where I think the government has failed actually, is that they have, because they haven't grasped the behavior challenge, they are making it harder for themselves to achieve net zero in their own strategy because they are missing out on this huge opportunity, I think, 
to make the whole task of decarbonizing the UK easier. And I think we need to find perhaps different ways of framing this, different narratives, because behaviour change does sound very confronting to people. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm, up for, I'm up for better terms. <laughs> yeah, I, should, I, I guess with the all reframing. So I guess this is partly the Bill Gates and others idea of having, if you've got an alternative technology, which is equal in price or maybe a very small green premium, you simply switch. You don't have to call that a behaviour change because people people switch to it. But actually, if you look at it, it is a behavioural change. We now use mobile phones rather than what the Germans now call stuck phones. Uh, and in fact, talking about the leap, I was, I was speaking to someone from South Korea the other day and their equivalent of social housing doesn't have any landline phone infrastructure. They skipped it all and went straight to mobile, which is a good example. So that if you build that into your uh, social housing in the fabric of your building, then actually it's cheaper and better and, and cost you less and you didn't need any landline infrastructure to do that. And that essentially is a kind of behavior change as well. But like you say, it's, it's to do a technology thing. And yeah, I, I really guess agree. Really techno optimists might even say, for instance, short haul aircraft, if you invest enough money, electric engines might get you there. Long haul, maybe not. But there are sort of other ways that even the things that you think, oh, flying is there. Well, if you maybe do a little bit less long haul and your short haul goes electric uh, and you have no issues with that, then there are actually other ways of, of getting there. I'm, I'm I, I'm not entirely convinced by the techno optimist uh, position, but they do have some points about actually maybe if, if you're not going to want to do that, then you just throw more money on the innovation side uh, to get around that. Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's the that's the key kind of challenge. I mean, I mentioned this work that we did a year ago, which looked at different scenarios for net zero, and we deliberately had an innovation scenario and a behavior change scenario. We wanted to, they were sort of archetype scenarios. We wanted to kind of stress, you know, each of those elements of the transition. What was interesting was they looked quite similar, actually, although in, in, the, in the innovation world, we were trying to stress some of these newer technologies, things like direct air capture, where you can take um, uh, carbon from the, from, the, from the air, from the atmosphere, um, without using a plant to do so. Um, you know, those kind of technologies, they, they, they're great. You know, if you, you might well have an optimistic view on um, uh, the, you know, the thing you talked about, aviation travel. I do, actually. I think, I think we will have those kind of, uh, I think we'll see progress there. But the reason that this, the scenarios look similar is even if you believe all that, you've got to still do some pretty straightforward stuff over the next 20, 30 years to get to net zero. And my big concern with the kind of techno optimist, I think I am a techno optimist, but I, I, the, kind of the, the, the big innovation proponents, particularly in the US, is that they sort of they duck the idea that you've got to do anything difficult that that that, you know, that, that eventually it'll all be fixed but it, but it it isn't it doesn't stand up to any any kind of scrutiny when you think about it in those terms if you look at how long a plane for example will be in operation at the moment it might be 30 40 years so you know that you know, unless you're going to actually physically take them out of the sky and put them out of commission to replace to be replaced with something else you know that you'll still be burning jet fuel in 2050 so actually that leads you to i think a more and that's definitely what you get from the CCC in our work. Just, just, a, just a more straightforward outlook on all of this, where we completely support those newer technologies, but we also think that you've got to, you've got to do the basics. Um, and I, th I would love more people to think that way about it. Yeah, I agree. I call that position kind of a techno-realist or techno-pragmatism. So you're not quite as extreme as Elon Musk, but you, you, there has to be part of the solution. I think that's where you get actually both centre-right and centre-left thinkers in that space. I think on the center left, uh, Ezra Klein and Adam Tews have sort of talked about that position in terms of political economy thinking, but even more market led uh, people also get there on, on, the, on the innovation front. Uh, actually, that, that leads me to remember, I was once uh, jokingly punched by Lord Deben, who I think is still your chair, uh, because, uh, because I called him an old white man in jest. Uh, and this was unfair because actually he is one of the most progressive environmentalist uh, politicians on the right side of the aisle and has been for for many years. Um, but it, it was really around this idea. And I guess that on the left, a lot of climate thinking is intertwined with other forms of inequality or poverty thinking coming under this term, I guess, of climate justice. And those on the right probably think about that a little bit less and think about growth and innovation in terms of helping the poor and trying not to entangle that with more straightforward uh, climate policy and their thinking, although a lot of it is, uh, is intertwined. 
And I was wondering, is there a way through these set of ideas about how you need to or not think about climate justice or things about that in terms of the fact that in some ways, like you say, the planet doesn't care, just the more carbon you put in the air, it will slowly warm. And, you know, if human beings decay out, you know, the dinosaurs came and got the planet Earth kind of way, it will probably still be around in a million years, humans may, may not be. Um, so I was kind of intrigued. Do you see any way through these set of ideas, climate justice, left, right, and, and that entangled with uh, things of, because inequality, poverty, growth, healthcare, there's all things. Some of that does entangle with climate, some of it uh, doesn't. Uh, but I guess a lot of progressive thinkers uh, push on all of those and makes it a little bit less clear for those maybe on the center right who want other policies on say poverty and growth, which don't want that entangled with climate. Yeah, I, this is, uh, for me, this is the, the critical issue now when it comes to that. I mean, I, there, you could talk for, for hours I mean, many, many hours about the technology transition that will drive net zero, and I would love to do that. But, and I, you know, I'd equally love to talk about the economics of that transition. But what that all tells us is that there is a sort of momentum in the technology space towards these decarbonized technologies, which is great. And the kind of underlying economics, again, in any scenario is profoundly positive, I think, now about this transition taking place. What, what it needs, of course, is policy to make that work. But it's the policy question that then keeps coming. The, the, the policy question for me that really jumps out at you is not really about which technology to support. It's, it's what you might call the fairness question. And I, I, I think this is now the critical issue, or probably always was the critical issue, but now, now it's very obvious. So I, I have to say, I don't have that much time, not because I don't believe it, but I don't think it's that compelling for many people. This, the, the, kind of the standard equity argument for acting on climate change is that we, in the rich Western economies, caused this problem, and therefore we should make reparations and make it happen quickly uh, and, and fix it and, and go faster than other countries in the world to fix it. Whilst that is true, it's, it's just not a compelling political narrative for a political leader, and we do need political leaders in this space. So I, I, for me, that the more compelling story when it comes to fairness is about the distribution of the costs and the benefits. And, I, and that, that for me is the fairness discussion that we need to have. You can have your own view on the equity arguments on climate change. Uh, and believe me, I absolutely hold the same view on that, that, it, you know, that we, we do have a historical legacy here. It is, it, those countries in the world that are suffering most from climate change have done the least to cause it. So there's a very obvious uh, equity problem there. Uh, the other equity problem, incidentally, is the, is the future generation problem. And this is the kind of reverse of, of COVID politics, funnily enough. You know, the, 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 future, the, the future generation, the younger generation, has suffered most during COVID because they have suffered the kind of economic insecurity that comes with the measures that we've had to take globally. And yet, weirdly, conversely, has had, has had the least risk from COVID. So, you know, the climate, is, climate politics is the flip of that. You know, we need the older generations to make, uh, you know, make, make right what they caused for the benefit of the future generation. Now, we may see that kind of clash coming out of this COVID pandemic. But all of that stuff, I, I just kind of set that aside. I don't think you need to believe any one thing on that to, to, to act on climate change. But what you definitely do need is a policy on spreading costs and benefits fairly in this transition to net zero. So I, for me, what the one I want to focus on, because although I think the overall cost of the transition in aggregate is low, no one experiences an aggregate cost. So there will be real costs for real people, depending where they live, what their job is, um, uh, you know, what kind of lifestyle they have and their income level. And although the overall cost of this is low, policy will need to try and spread those costs across the economy. And it will also have to try and spread the benefits as well. And I think the benefit spreading is even harder in many ways than the spreading of the costs. It leads you usually to thinking about fiscal tools, tax policies, but actually it's much more fundamental than that, I think. It's about where you put investments, for example, for some of the industries that you might need for net zero. Do you put them in places that, were, that, that have been damaged by previous transitions? That is, seems to be the logic of what the present government is trying to do. Uh, you know, these kind of thoughtful things need to be brought out into the open, I think. But fairness for me now is the issue uh, when it comes to net zero. And, I, I, and the equity stuff is really at the margins of that from my perspective. How do you think we might get a better read on that? I reflect on two things, sort of an imaginary coal miner uh, 
you know, or stories that I hear from them, they don't mind so much losing their own livelihoods if their sons and daughters have really great opportunities in, in something else. Uh, but that's quite a hard transition to do. And, you know, that's both generational and, and, and different jobs. I'm intrigued by uh, the climate assembly process, which I know you were uh, uh, partly involved as. I was slightly disappointed that I didn't feel I got as much out of that or widespread acknowledgement as it, because I, I do feel that's one a sort of deliberative democratic process which might get us further along as it did, for instance, with uh, abortion in Ireland. It doesn't seem to have triggered in the UK here as much, but, but maybe it's early days. Um, so I don't know if you thought of any other ways of, of where we're going to get to this fair yeah, discussion, or is it still of, early? Well, it is still early, but we're going to run out of time if we don't put in place some uh, strategic policies to support all of this. I think it is a policy discussion, actually. That I, I sort of mulled over in my mind whether I would use that word, but but I, I think it's the right word. Um, I, I had a, a pretty amazing experience on that climate assembly that you talked about. Actually, I've been involved in a couple of them. There's one in Scotland as well that I had, had a slightly reduced role in, but the UK one I was very central to. And a story I tell quite frequently now is that I went into that process um, pretty dubious about it, actually, um, looking back, kind of sniffy about the benefit of these processes, because for me, as the, the guy who leads the institution that does the numbers, I was worried about undermining that technical analysis with this stuff about thoughts and feelings, you know, this kind of, and I was totally wrong about that. And I don't mind admitting it because it turns out if you get a group of people in a room, if you explain the issue to them in straightforward terms, there, of course, there are people at the margins who think that they still don't want to do anything about it, but most of them feel quite compelled to actually get into the issues at that point. If you then present them with solutions to some of the problems that we talked about, and the Climate Assembly in the UK was about how you get to net zero, then they're up for it. And, I, and funnily enough, the, 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 great, the great British public are actually pretty sensible in that, in that moment. They understand the, the kind of nature of the challenge quite easily, and they equally understand the solutions. And um, the challenge wasn't to get them to support those solutions. It was, it was, it was, the challenge was to hold them back, actually, from uh, wanting to be involved in the, in, in the, in the process after it finished. And I, I, I think that's fascinating. There's definitely a clue in that, but I definitely agree with you that it didn't have the traction that a process as good as that I feel should have had. Now, we used a lot of the insights from that process in our technical modeling, which is, I think, the way that, that we will continue to work. So we, you know, the work that comes out of that climate assembly has fed into the technical modeling that we've done since. And then we have a good handle on some of the key things like behavior change we've talked about already. But we need to do a bit more than that. The other outlook on this, which I think is slightly more productive in the current political climate, is that we know this is an investment heavy transition. It does involve doing investing in capital technologies kit. Um, and we know we need to do that throughout the country. This is not, uh, this is not a game changing conclusion, but, we, but it, I think it's become more obvious that, that, that this is a large an investment story. And in the world where you're making investments of the order of, we say 50 billion, the government says 60 billion extra capital expenditure across the economy each year from about 2030 onwards. In that world, you can direct a lot of that investment. You can put it in places where there hasn't been that kind of investment. And if you know you're gonna to have to do it, you have to believe that the legal targets we have in this country will be delivered. I do believe that. But if you know that they're, therefore they will be delivered, then you also know that that investment has to be made. And I think that is a, pretty interesting set of circumstances because it means you can frame up some of the policies that we have never had in previous transitions coal being the obvious most recent one in the, in the 70s the move away from coal we didn't have a good sense of what was coming next we didn't plan for it in that way i'm not talking here about a planned economy but i am saying that, that, that there are some aspects of this transition that lend themselves quite well to planning that investment, which will mostly be private investment, but shaping it to go to certain territories of the country. Um, and I, I'm quite excited about that, because I think that is, a, that is a route into talking about some of the fairness things in a, in, a, in a more productive way, regardless of your political view on it all. So for me, that's another kind of interesting angle on it, even if you don't want to do climate assemblies. Yeah, I, I kind of think that if we had more climate assembly type thing, I'm very fond of this participatory form. Uh, I've held unconferences myself, just getting people involved. Because a lot of this is, to use a great British English term, common sense in some ways. And like you say, again, something that I believe uh, and I think is true is in general, we're not en masse that 
stupid, right? We can grapple with that. It's just a lot of the information isn't told to us in plain English. You know, there's this acronyms and jargons and politicians don't say anything of substance anymore. But when presented with that, uh, a vast majority of people agree on a set of things and reasonable people disagree at the margins of things where there's difficult things uh, to agree upon. So I kind of think more of that would actually get people thinking more pragmatically given that actually, as you say, it's happening. So it will, it will have to come sooner or later and the later you do it, the more it will cost and the more disruptive it will be. Maybe the, second- the, 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 Well, the, the, just very briefly on that, because I think it's really, the, 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 there are certain aspects of this transition that will lend it themselves better to that style of work than others. And the one I would keep coming back to is the challenge of how you decarbonize buildings. Because communities across the country we live in those communities. They are different anywhere you go. And that's what's interesting about traveling around the countries. You find that villages, towns, cities look different depending where you are. They have different types of buildings, different historical legacy, different, different employment patterns as well. All the other stuff that goes with that. Actually bringing groups of people together to talk about how you invest in those communities and as a byproduct almost make them decarbonized is really important because people feel that they have some handle on it then. Some insight in it and they and they want to do it and that's basically what the climate assembly told us so I, i'm a I'm big advocate for doing more of yeah it. and regional uh, and local plans can, us to do can intertwine health and some other things which you, i think you've said it yourself it's likely to be localized plans because different local regions have different needs maybe yeah. circling and trying to put all of the net zero thing together before moving a little bit onto finances so my read of the ccc analysis has four buckets of meeting net zero demand reduction and efficiency the low carbon solutions like electrification, low carbon energy, and then offsets. And you've done a call out for voluntary offsets. Uh, so we'll collect evidence uh, this year. Um, and it happens to happen across the whole economy, agriculture, land use, transport buildings, industry. And on this, is there anywhere would you like to highlight where we might be doing better or where we need more lagging or more innovation? It seems from this conversation and what I've heard before, kind of buildings and industry and maybe transport to some extent are, are those two or three clusters because there has to be a conversation on buildings and we're perhaps a little bit behind the curve and an in industry the observation that uh, that you made and I think we've said that is that if you go five years ago and come to, to today we made a lot more progress than perhaps we would have thought we might have been there for five years ago so maybe it is buildings uh, industry or transport but is there anything you'd like to sum up on on net zero where we you may we want to concentrate more on or where you kind of want to highlight there's been some good work on? Well, listen, it'd be very good if I could sit here. And I think when I look back on it in previous discussions, maybe a couple of years ago, I would have given this answer, actually. But it'd be very good to be able to say, look, we're doing well on the power sector, you know, and we need to now focus on, I don't know, transport or heat. But I, the truth is, actually, although we have done quite well on the power sector, there's a hell of a lot more to do even in that sector. So I'm afraid the slightly glib answer is that we're, we're not doing enough in any area. And the challenge of scaling up to the degree that we need to scale up over the course of this decade to get to net zero on time is pretty, a pretty impressive challenge. Um, so we'll need to do a lot more in all areas. The areas where I think we see the biggest gap now, though, are definitely in that buildings challenge. The government does have a view now on how to decarbonize buildings in the way that it didn't even a year ago. But if I can characterize it, it's quite a kind of atomized market led outlook on how you fix that challenge. So you almost you sort of set the incentives in the right place and people just magically switch from gas boilers to heat pumps. Um, we know that that's not quite how it will work. So I think there's a lot more to do in the buildings front, not least to design and plan a bit better the kind of communal solutions that we'll need if you go to the countries on the, on the continent, particularly Scandinavia, you find they use district heating networks and, and not gas networks. Actually, that kind of stuff really matters. So a bit of work there would really open that up. I think transport is heading in the right way, but that's mainly because of electric vehicles. And we also need to stop using vehicles quite as much as we do at the moment. So there's still challenges there. But the big gap, I'm afraid, is in the natural world uh, and in agriculture. Um, we... We, we, we know what broadly we need to do, but it's a messy old business decarbonizing land and, uh, and farming. Uh, and we don't quite know what to do, nor do we know what policies will work. And I think for me, that's one of the most interesting areas now. So I want to bring together the net zero work with our work on adaptation, but also looking at issues like biodiversity and food production, food systems, try and build a more integrated view of what needs to happen there. I think that's the challenge for us over the next few, few years. And the last, the last sector, which I haven't mentioned, but I will briefly give a very 
uh, important mention too is, is industry. Um, and, and I think we know what to do now with decarbonizing the manufacturing and construction sectors, but it's a big policy ask. Uh, we've pretty dramatically changed our outlook on how you decarbonize those industries. And, and mainly we've done so by building a better sense of how you invest in those sectors to decarbonize them and catch the investment cycles early. Uh, if we don't do that, then those industries are, are going to be really hard to decarbonize at the pace that we need to decarbonize them. And that kind of brings in, I suppose, some of the big policy questions of the age, like carbon border adjustments, emissions trading schemes, carbon taxes, how, you know, that, that kind of stuff is really front line, I think. Now. But there's, there's stuff to do across the piece. That's why my job's so interesting. Great. So maybe turning to the sort of second order um, element for our last kind of few minutes, which is on finance, so financing uh, a lot of this in the real economy. And I've had some questions in from, from listeners on the finance and economics of climate change, and I'll put them in three buckets and we'll come around to them, but I'll, I'll put them all together. The first bucket really is, what do you think are the options or even the best options for financing this? As it seems the longer we wait, the more we have to pay, but there are sort of the difficulties in parsing those options. The second is that um, there's a lot going on in terms of changing or nudging financial regulation and even thinking about what obligations investors or companies might have. Uh, and in that thinking, is there anything you think we should be embedding within uh, financial regulation or financial nudging of markets that could be useful? And the third bucket, I guess, is around the economics around climate change or the, the models. Are, are they too far off to be kind of that useful and what is the thinking on that side so there's been a lot of pushback in terms of like oh it's a few percent of gdp here and that but if you put a lot of those inputs if you think about natural capital they just seem way off those sort of tail risk and some of the local and regional risks about this there has to be a wholesale change of our economic model thinking of incorporating i guess more human capital or natural capital or does what we have is is sufficient to 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 where we need to drive so i guess coming back to yeah. the first question on uh options for financing that and if you want to roll into financial regulation we can but uh we can do that well the first thing to do and i i i always forget to do this when i speak uh, on podcasts or events is, is to plug a piece of work that we have already done on this and, and if any of your listeners are interested we had a, a absolutely brilliant um forum chaired by nick robbins at the lse uh looking at this question of what it means to have um, uh, you know, kind of net zero aligned financial system uh, alongside the more conventional questions of how you finance net zero. It's a brilliant report and I can't possibly do it justice in, the, in a very short answer, but have a, having a look at that is, is, is a good place to start. If anyone is interested in it, it's on our website, you'll find it. Um, uh, just have a look under finance. But the, kind of, the main point coming out of that, that work, he, he chaired this advisory group of stellar names and we more or less swallowed his recommendations in our final recommendations to government. What he was saying is that you know, the UK, UK's commitment to net zero will not be a problem to finance. Um, you know, the, the, there is no, there's no problem with the, the, you know, the availability of capital, uh, but what, what there isn't I suppose and I'm massively simplifying Nick's work here is, 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 the, is, the, is the, the translation mechanism to make sure that that wall of capital, as it's sometimes discussed by people like Mark Carney, gets to the places it needs to get. And, and that's policy. It's mainly about making sure that policy permits that. And one of, again, without going into too much detail about it, one of the really important reasons why that is important is back to the old story of energy. Uh, and how we decarbonize our energy system, which is still one of the kind of central planks of, of the challenge overall. We are moving from a world where at the moment, the model uh, for conventional energy production and use is that the consumer pays mostly for the thing that is being burned. When you think most obvious, I suppose, about electricity generation, the consumer is paying for a fossil fuel to be burned in return for which they get their electricity. Um, the, the future, energy system that we'll have is fundamentally different. The, the fuel in a renewable system or even a nuclear system is, is essentially free. But what you need the consumer to pay for is the capital cost of the thing that generates the electricity. And I'm sticking with electricity because it makes this, it makes this story simpler. You therefore need policies that permit that consumer uh, to, re, to permit consumers to repay investors for that capital kit. And, you know, that's difficult. I think this is one of the areas where the UK has done really well, actually, is to put policies in place to allow 
large scale renewables to be financed in that way that I've just described. And I suppose extending it, the challenge is to do that in other areas. So I mean, that is for me, one of the key uh, challenges that we haven't yet tackled is to make sure that, that, that policy is in place to allow capital to flow to those other technologies with other challenges. And then the other thing that's in place is, is the kind of regulation around finance, as you've, uh, you've highlighted in your question. And it's hugely important to have that. Uh, the financial disclosure rules there are immensely important. They are not the answer to this, but they do raise the issue, hopefully to the level of the boardroom, uh, if you're a large corporate having to now comply with that. And they certainly do if you're um, a financial institution having to look at what risks you're exposed to uh, when it comes to climate. I rather like the way Mark Carney frames this up, and it's slightly oversimplistic, but I think that's why I like it, that he talks about the two main risks here being the kind of transition risk uh, and the risk of climate change itself. And, and you need to be alive to both of those when you're thinking about disclosing it, because climate is driving uh, you know, pretty fundamental shift in asset values, apart from anything else. Now, when you bring all that together, and there's a much more rich story that we could spend longer talking on uh, if we had the time, I think this all looks quite appealing. And for me, that's what's exciting is I think we have moved from thinking of finance as a sort of background condition, uh, you know, within which you will achieve your aims on climate to thinking actually, you know, finance is, is a lever. It's an enabler of progress. Uh, and I'm really excited about that kind of outlook on it. And it also takes us into a thing that we haven't really talked enough about yet, but where we are planning some work here in the CCC on how you finance adaptation as well as net zero and mitigation and that's a harder challenge but I, I think we can do that through that kind of potent mix of policy and disclosure requirements and regulation so I, I think there's a lot more to do here but it's something I, you can expect that we're going to do more work on. Excellent and I'll provide the link to uh, Nick's work which is really good uh, in the uh, in the comments below. So in our, in our last five minutes I thought we'd do a quick fire section maybe uh, I call it overrated, underrated, but you can just do a sort of neutral or a comment on it, uh, and then we'll we'll end with a final question. So I'll, I'll sort of push out an idea, and you can say whether you think it's overrated or underrated, or some uh, quick comment on it. So um, let's start with uh, divestment as a strategy: overrated or underrated? Massively overrated. So we do need, I think, uh, fossil fueled industries to make the transition. I, I think it, 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 they have the balance sheets to do it. That transition will happen more quickly if they do. I think it also is the case, however, if they're not willing to do so, then, then they should be viewed as pariahs and divestment becomes a more legitimate strategy there. But we're not going to get to net zero globally without the support of those uh, energy corporates mainly. Excellent. Carbon offsets. Um, oh, I can't answer that, but I'll say that I think this is such an interesting topic and so much so that we've just done a call for evidence on it and anyone listening to this should go to our website and, uh, and, and submit some answers to the questions that we've asked. There is a role for offsets. Very important to say that. And even more important to say that that role changes over time. So you know, the, the, the role of offsets today is going to be very different from the role of offsets by 2050. And actually, that's really hard to communicate. Um, so I, I, I probably underrated, actually, given that all I've said there as a, as a tool. Yeah, it's not stationary over time. I think that's a really important thing that we're going to need to develop and change with the time. Interesting. Um, nuclear power, or, or maybe more precisely, mini nukes, but any thoughts on nuclear in general? So nuclear's really important role. I mean, it, it, it's, um, I don't know the extent to which it, it will play a role in the UK energy system, except to say that without it, we're going to really struggle to get to net zero. In our modeling, it does about 20% of total generation. Uh, and it plays a particularly important role because of the quality of uh, the, the, the service that it's provided from nuclear. But you can get it from something else. So it's important to say that you could do something with carbon capture that delivered the same kind of service. But I tend to think nuclear is something we want. But the real big challenge is we don't want it to crowd out the cheap stuff. Uh, so if you've got too much nuclear, then you crowd out the, you know, the cheap renewables uh, that we every year discover become cheaper. So uh, that is a difficult balance to strike given how long it takes to build a nuclear plant. And that brings us to suppose to these mini nukes. And I, I, I don't, I'm indifferent to it really. I think that they potentially have a really important system value. Uh, I'm dubious about them being able to be built quickly. Uh, and, and back to something I said much earlier in this discussion, that matters because in this transition to net zero, 
um, we need things that, that we can actually plan confidently. Uh, and we won't, I don't think that many of these new nuke technologies will be present until maybe the 2040s or later. So again, it's one of those things that I think we should support. Let's see how it goes, but let's not rely on it. Uh, Green New Deal, or the idea that we could create a lot of jobs in a green revolution. Yeah, I, I, whether it's overstated or understated, but very important. Um, I don't much like the term, mm. although I think we're trying to do something quite different with it. And I, I do think it's been captured by a particular part of the political spectrum. But I do, th I think in the UK, people like Ben Houchen have really got the secret sauce for how you maintain public support for net zero and climate change because they are tying it so explicitly to jobs. And it's not all about jobs, but we know that that's a good strategy to maintain public support. So I do think there are lots and lots and lots of jobs in this transition. And I have no problem with people who want to make that association. Um, road charging as a new tool. Oh, this is the piece of work I want to do, um, <laughs> but uh, we haven't done it yet. And it's a sort of economist wet dream, isn't it, road charging? Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know if it's the right policy because the politics is so tricky, but I definitely see the value of it. And we are right up against it when it comes to replacing fuel duties in this country, because uh, just briefly on that, we've got uh, raises about 28 billion a year at the moment. So that's the, the duties that we all pay on the, uh, the fuels that we use for transport. That will dwindle very quickly if we make the switch to electric vehicles as quickly as I think we are about to. Uh, and the replacement for that is something that requires a lot of thought and a lot of planning and a lot of careful design. Now, if you work that through in the political cycle that we have in the UK, uh, we, um, we, we have probably got that it will be the next parliament where we need to see the implementation of these big tax reforms for transport policy. And that means potentially that election will happen next year or the year after. It means that we need to be doing the thinking now for what replaces fuel duty. Uh, so this is really upon us, I think. And, and uh, we hope to do some work on this. Others will do so too. But uh, it's not strictly speaking a climate issue. It's a sort of impact of Boris Johnson's own policy, which is to, is to phase out the sale of petrol and diesel cars. Yeah, all of the economists tell me road charging is better, but then they told me this is the same with carbon tax. So <laughs> uh, um, uh, who knows? But I, I would also say that initially congestion charge was also much more controversial and now London pretty much accepts it. And uh, I think the mayor has uh, said that he's going to start some work on road charging because they will, they will need the revenue. OK, so then uh, last uh, question on that that was all really interesting, which is, uh, do you have any uh, general advice or thoughts uh, for the listener? So one could be, do you have any left field advice, you know, a moonshot? You might only put 1% of your resources into it, but you kind of think, you know what, this is an option. If it really hits or pays off, we could do, a, we could do a, something really big, even though there's a small chance that it might happen. Or maybe to the general listener who wants to involve themselves in more policy or work or innovation in this, is there any two or three areas you kind of think, oh, you know, like we may, maybe mentioned buildings or transport or policies, like go into that. We just need more bright, clever people working on those uh, on those problems. Right. So you've you've hit me with a curveball. So I'm prepared an answer to this, but I'm I'm going to give you a slightly divergent answer to it if I can. Sure. So it's short and punchy. Uh, to anyone who's interested in this, my kind of take on it is the answer to your question. Um, believe that this is going to happen. Uh, it's really important. So having a general belief that all the things that we, you and I have talked about today are, are legitimate and probable because that really opens up the possibilities. That's my kind of first thing. And then the second thing, and there are only two, and the second thing is going back to a point I made earlier, um, don't rely too much on kind of unicorn technologies and things that we haven't yet, we haven't yet invented. As appealing as they are, they are firstly not necessary, and secondly, almost certainly a delaying tactic. If you if you follow that uh, that kind of line of argument, so believing that we can do something on this, that it will be cost effective to do so, but also sticking to the boring stuff that we know we need to do, and you will find the investable propositions. I think through that through that that lens, uh, and that's pretty much the outlook that we have in the CCC. Great. So that seems to me excellent advice. So once again. Chris Stark, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. If you appreciate the show, please like and subscribe as it helps others find the podcast.